participated in that. There's a question if you were to ask, well, let's say 20 different people. If you were to ask this question, I bet you might get maybe 20 different answers. If you were to go up to someone and say, all right, what is your salvation? What is, what is your saving grace? You might get a lot of different answers depending on what their concept of salvation or saving grace might be. But you might get some, well, my education is my salvation. You know, that's, that's what's got me through life. My education, I appreciate it so much, and that's what's got me to where I am. Others might say, well, it's, it's my money. I can always depend on my money being there, and uh, that's what has been a blessing to me all of these days. Some might say, well, it's my family. My family's my salvation. They're my saving grace. If it was not for them, I don't know what I would be doing, where I would be. Some might say it's their job. Some might say, but most of you here could say, it's my good looks. And then there's Robert and I. We might say, oh, man. <laughs> well, the list could go on and on. And I don't know how you would answer that question. And in some ways, uh, your answer is as important, is not as important as what the Bible says. What is our salvation? Well, very clearly in one verse, I want to share with you from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it simply says this, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Now we're in the middle of this uh, Big G Little Me series. This week and next week we're going to wrap that up. But we've been looking at this concept. We've got things upside down sometimes. Where we make ourselves the center of the universe. Where I can do it all on my own. I am my own salvation. I can do all things because I am who I am. But in this Big G Little Me series, we want to turn that upside down and realize that God has to be the most important thing. And we need to see how we fit into who He is. And I just simply looked at phrases in the Bible that said, God is. And this verse jumped out. said, God is what? My salvation. Now I think it's important for us to always, when we're looking at Scripture, to get the context Why was this said? Who said it? What was going on? I think it makes it a little more real when we realize those things. So the background of this verse comes from the prophet Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 12. Now, the first verse of this chapter starts out like this. In that day, you will say, I I will praise you, O Lord, Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you had comforted me. Now, I don't know about you, but it's, a, it's kind of a, in that day. What, in what day? What, what's he talking about here? What has happened where the people would say, God, you were angry with me. What has gone on? So you've got to understand the backstory here, if you want to call it that. The prophet Isaiah came upon the scene and he is prophesying to the children of Israel. In the first ten chapters of Isaiah, almost every chapter is a warning. If you do not turn your life back to me, this is what's going to happen to you. And that's what happened. The people turned their back on God. They did their own thing. They did it their own way. They became their own salvation, they thought. And then... God promises. But after that happens, there's going to become a day where you're going to stop and you're going to look back and you're going to realize some things. Isn't that interesting? Where it says, although you were angry with me. Who's that talking about? It's the children of Israel recognizing that God was angry with them. You ever been there? Wondered, what did I do to God to make Him seemingly mad at me? I talk to Him, I I pray, and nothing seems to happen. I ask for guidance or wisdom, and, 
And just nothing. What do you do in those moments? What do you do in those deserts of life? Well, Wednesday night I uh, shared in the Bible study a video, a guy in Hawaii by the name of Wayne Codario, great speaker, and he did this illustration with an Etsy sketch and a Polaroid camera. And I was going to go out and buy an Etsy sketch and a Polaroid camera. Well, Etsy sketches aren't too prominent around, and neither are Polaroid cameras. I found someone in the line, it was going to be about 90 bucks to get those things. So I decided, said, I'm just going to show you the video clip of him, and we're going to get this free, okay? So watch this for just a moment. And the context of this, he's addressing what happens in life when God has got your attention and you're not sure what to do, okay? They said, what? Remember these Etch-a-Sketches here? How many of you used to play with these things? Raise your hand. Yeah. How many of you still play with these things? Raise your hand. Okay. Yeah. God bless you, you old folks. All right. But you would you do some etch a sketching with this your little thing here, and and uh, and when you want to erase it, what do you do? Yeah, you shake it. But a lot of us are like etch a sketch Christians because as soon as God shakes us, everything that we have worked for, all of a sudden, shoot, that bugger he's gone. It's gone. We're etch-a-sketch Christians. As soon as God shakes you up, well, if this is the way the church is going to treat me, I'm out of here. I ain't going to church no more. I'm done. It's like, what? God's taught you so much about patience and understanding people's weak points and having a perseverance with them and knowing that forgiveness is, oh, that's it. If that's the way the church is going to be, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm not going to church anymore. If that's the way God's going to treat me, I'm not going to believe in God. No, I don't even believe in Him anymore. I'm done. I'm done. It's like, what happened to everything that I taught you? And I start to shake you up a little to teach you something, and you eradicate everything that you stand for in faith. That's a veneer kind of faith, isn't it? You see, there's a lot of us that don't you get, bro, get me on my bad side. I'll amputate you, bro. I'll just let you know. That's it. You're out of here. You're done. It's like, well, you're an etch-a-sketch Christian. That's right. The door swings both ways. <laughs> Instead of being an etch-a-sketch Christian, when, every, when God just shakes you up, you just kind of throw everything out the window. Everything you learn. That's it. I'm done. My marriage, I'm done. Church, I'm done. God, I'm done. I'm done. What? I know a lot of etch-a-sketch Christians. But instead, I want to encourage you to be a Polaroid camera. Christian. Remember these? Yeah. You're either going to be an etch a sketch or a Polaroid. Smile. You're on candid camera. And you see that little, I don't know where it went, but there's a. That bugger is in here someplace. But we'll get one of these here and I'll get another one. And what we do is we shake these things. Remember? We shake them. And as we shake it and shake it, it starts to develop little by little. And we look at that and we think, oh, that's what it's supposed to be. You see, what takes place is some people, when they get shaken, everything is gone, evaporates. That's it. I'm done. Other people are like Polaroid Christians. God shakes them. And when he does, they develop. Things get clearer. They start to see a picture emerging of what God wants of their life. Will you be an etch a sketch? Or are you going to be a Polaroid Christian? Interesting question. I love that illustration. Very simple to understand. Which are we going to be? When tough times come in our life, and all of us at one time or other will face or have faced or are facing tough times. Which are we going to be? Are we going to, when we are shaken, say, oh, I'm, I'm forgetting everything. Forget it all. Or do we let ourselves be developed and begin to understand maybe a little bit more of who we are and who God wants us to be and how we are to live our lives? You see, back at verse 2, that verse we started with, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. 
He has become my salvation. The children of Israel, when they were faced with the greatest calamity they'd ever faced in the history of their nation, God says, there's going to come a point where you're going to realize who I am and just what I've done and what it's going to take. Today I want to focus on two things about salvation. That from this whole chapter, chapter 12 of Isaiah, it's only six verses, but it's some good stuff in there. If we want to understand that God, big G, and we are the little me, we need to first focus on the salvation of God. Now, interesting thing, when we think of salvation, I would guess that most of us think of the New Testament. The concept of salvation is found in the New Testament, and Jesus comes and He dies for us on the cross, and through Him we find salvation. But did you know that the word salvation appears almost two times as many, twice as many times in the Old Testament as it does in the New Testament? I was surprised. I didn't realize. You'll find the word salvation 80 times in the Old Testament. You'll find it 41 times in the New Testament. Now, I think there is a differentiation in kind of the context of what that word means. In the Old Testament, some, but not all the time, but some of the times, the word salvation could be translated deliverance. That we were delivered from something. Think of the story of the Exodus. You've heard that. Moses takes the troops across the, uh, the Red Sea. Egyptian army comes in, and then the, the, the wall of water comes down and wipes them out. The children of Israel were delivered. Their salvation, same word, came that day. And it was that event that the Jews were to remember every year in the Passover. Their salvation came from God. So I want us to think about that concept for just a moment. You see, there's other concepts of salvation in the New, the New Testament, or I'm sorry, the Old Testament. Psalm 27, verse 1. David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? But if you look at the rest of verse, or, uh, Psalm 27, what you'll find him talking about, his enemies. David had all kinds of enemies. All the nations around him were coming and attacking him. They were trying to pull him down. He had all kinds of enemies. And he starts off saying, The Lord is my light and my salvation. He was looking to God for deliverance from something. Okay? I think that concept that concept of salvation... Or deliverance is still valid for us to grasp today. There are enemies that live within us and around us at different times. For some it's alcohol, for some it's greed, for some it's bad relationships, for some it's materialism, for some it's selfishness, and this could go on and on and on. We all have enemies that we need to be, de- to be delivered from. How do you do that? How do you let God deliver you from those things? Well, David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? (coughs) Fear is a good question, isn't it? Whom shall I fear? What does fear do? Well, it makes you afraid. Duh. I want you to go deeper than that, all right? Fear paralyzes you. Fear stops you in your tracks. Fear sometimes stops you from doing what you know you should do. Fear can come in all different ways. I I was talking to a a doctor one time, and he had gotten hooked on prescription painkillers. He'd gone to the dentist and had some dental work done and got hooked on painkillers. And since he was a doctor, when that prescription ran out, he still was in pain, so he wrote himself a script. And ended up, he got hooked on this stuff. And uh, he thought that it was all okay. Until finally his partner in the, the, uh, the, the doctor's office there noticed it. They confronted him. And then he went and he got help from that. And I was talking to him and I said, how in the world, how in the world did you let that happen? I mean, in your mind, you had to know that uh, this wasn't the way it should. And what he said was this. 
I was afraid that I wouldn't be functioning normally if I didn't have the stuff. And that fear of not being able to function the way he thought he should function is what actually drove him to do the things that he knew he shouldn't be doing. It's kind of a strange thing, but that's the way it happens in so many lives. And David says in Psalm 27, The Lord is my strength and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? He says the Lord is his stronghold. What do you think of when you think of stronghold? Kind of a fort, something that's going to be there. Two weeks ago, I talked about um, uh, God is the, our, my rock and my fortress. I want you to think about that. What is the stronghold in your life? What is it that you know you can set your feet firmly on and you know it's going to hold you steadfast? That's what we need. And to David, and I believe for us, it needs to be the Lord. The Lord, the Scripture says, the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many things today remain the same for a long time? How many of you have, have owned, I'm going to say, at least five different cell phones? Okay? Or well, since you first, your first cell phone, all right? Remember those, those fancy new cell phones they came out with? There were these brick-type things. You had to pull the antenna up, about the size of a walkie-talkie, you know? Computers. I remember my first computer... It was a Commodore 64, hooked it up to a little black and white TV in my office there. And I was on the cutting edge of technology, all right? My watch has more computing capability than a Commodore 64 did. So much in this world changes, time after time. And we, we have grown accustomed to that. We buy something new and say, oh, in a couple of years it'll be outdated anyway. And that's pretty much it. Who do you turn to, though, when you feel like you're being shaken? Focus on the salvation of God. No matter what, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His Word that was the Word thousands of years ago is still the Word for the day. And His word for today is the word for tomorrow. And His promises for tomorrow will come by because we have seen Him work faithfully in the past. So I really want to encourage us all when it comes to these times in our life when we feel shaken and God tells the children of Israel in verse 1, there's going to come a time where it says, Lord, you were angry at me. But don't dwell there. Go to the next level. In verses 3 through the following, through 6, he makes another point. How are we to do it? We're to draw. We're not only to focus on the Lord's salvation, but we're also to draw upon His salvation. A resource of refreshment. Look at verse 3. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on His name, make known among the nations what He has done, and proclaim that His name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for He has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. You see, salvation comes from God. And I said the word is used two major ways. In the Old Testament, many times it's that deliverance from enemies. But in the New Testament, we find all of a sudden that Old Testament word of deliverance, that concept of being taken away from our enemies, is very quickly applied to our spiritual lives. And this concept of deliverance and salvation becomes no longer just an earthly thing, but it becomes a heavenly thing. Listen to what was said to Zechariah about his son, John the Baptist, in Luke chapter 1, verse 76. And it says this of John the Baptist, You will go 
on before the Lord to prepare the way for Him. And we know all that about that, about John the Baptist, the one crying in the wilderness, dressed in weird clothes, ate locusts and wild honey, whatever locusts were, there were bugs or whatever. And, and John was quite an interesting guy. So he's going before the Lord to prepare the way, but then verse 40, 30, 77, it gives his purpose. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. All of a sudden, salvation takes this transition from being escaping from something to receiving something. Salvation is receiving the gift of God. Salvation is receiving the eternal life. And I love the imagery there. In verse 3, it says, Draw water from the wells of salvation. Just think about that. It's not the same in our society. If you want to drink water, what do you do? You go to the faucet, or you go to the refrigerator, or whatever, wherever the... And we just get water, it's no big deal. Back in those days, and in many other places in the world, today, when I was in Africa, this is the way it would be. You'd see kids carrying these big five-gallon jugs of water. Well, why didn't they just get it at their house? Because they didn't have running water at their house. They had to go to where the well was been going on for thousands of years. That well is a point of life. In the very desert, rocky terrain of Palestine and Galilee, they all would have understood that. Draw from the well of salvation. That's where you would go on a daily basis to sustain life. Going to that well. Beautiful imagery when it comes to our spiritual lives. Do we draw from the well of salvation on a daily basis because we know that is where we will find life? With joy, he says, you will draw from the well of salvation. And then he goes on in those verses... It gives us some things to do. In that day, in what day? In that day when they realize that God is their salvation. In that day when they realize that He is the only one that they could turn to. In that day when they understand that He is the one that has given them hope in life. And so should it be with us. It says, in that day, give thanks to the Lord. And call on His name. Make known where? Among the nations of what He has done, and proclaim His name, for it is exalted. Sing to the Lord. Why? For He has done glorious things. Why do we sing on Sunday mornings? Just because we need to fill a half an hour before I get up here to preach? No. That's the only reason you sing, you're missing the whole point. We sing to the Lord, for He has done glorious things. And let this be made known unto the world. So draw deep from the well of salvation. And then give God the thanks for the things He has done. And sing a new song, just like what we sang this morning. Power and honor and glory and praise for all that He has done. Let Him be the big G while we find how we fit into His salvation. I don't know where everyone is today when it comes to this saving relationship with God. And I I say that, I want to emphasize that relationship aspect. Because salvation is not just coming to church and sitting here. It's developing that relationship with Him. Proclaiming Him as Lord and Savior. 
obeying the things that He has taught us and the things that He teaches us to do in His world. If you don't have that relationship with Him, if you don't really grasp all of that, you know, I'd love to sit down with you sometime and talk about that. Or maybe, maybe you have that, and maybe you've been struggling with that, even for years. Maybe today is the day, not only for you to draw from the wealth of salvation, but for you to accept the salvation that He has for you. We're going to sing a song. And if you need to accept the salvation that He has for you, to accept Him, to begin that walk with Him, I invite you to just come on up. And I'll talk with you and and, uh, we'll pray. and We'll understand what God's grace is in your life. Let's stand.